Mantle Ministries presents Richard Little Bear Wheeler. Come join Little Bear in true adventures of the past and discover biblical principles that can change your life. Greetings, pilgrims, patriots, and friends. As far back as I can remember in my boyhood, I loved the Old West, the Cowboys, the Indians, the soldiers, and the gunfighters. We're going to tell you a gunfighting story that should uh, be very exciting for today's uh, episode. Uh, in fact, this is probably one of the most famous gunfights that took place in the Old West. Uh, let me uh, first explain to you about the firearms. Uh, you know, when I was just a little boy, I used to take a six-shooter like this. Uh, it was a toy one, of course, and I'd practice twirling that thing. And uh, you got to be real careful because guns are super dangerous. If the gun doesn't belong to you, don't play with it. And I never use live ammunition. I always use just the primer caps to shoot my guns. But uh, I used to take that old handgun and just holster it like that, just over and over, and do some trick fancy holstering. I don't know, I must have seen somebody do it in some old movie. Then I'd try going forward like that. And then I would go where I could twist it, twirl it, and, uh, and uh, holster it at the same time. Well, then I thought I'd get fancy, and I thought I would try throwing the gun. So I got to where I could catch the gun in the air like that. See, throw it over my leg. And then I got where I could throw it behind my back. Oh. They try that again, like that, see there? Like that. And then I would uh, twist that back and forth and then holster it. But anyway, in this story, uh, it's the year of October. It's uh, October 26th, 1881. It's the famous Battle of the OK Corral. And this is what happened. Wyatt Earp and his brother, who was the marshal of Tombstone, Arizona, Virgil, and uh, another brother named Morgan faced uh, one of the most deadly foes. Uh, it was the Clanton brothers, Ike and Billy Clanton. Of course, Ike and Billy brought with them a man by the name of Tom and his brother Frank McLowry, the McLowry brothers. Well, by and large, most of these cowboys were cattle rustlers, troublemakers, and no good for nothings. And uh, of course, Wyatt Earp and his brother uh, had nothing but trouble with them. And so this led to this deadly battle, the Battle of the O.K. Corral. You see, let me explain a little bit about the Old West. Uh, law and order in those days was handled by a gun, and, and uh, to keep peace in town, Virgil passed a law that you couldn't carry firearms, six shooters, uh, in the town. And uh, he, he uh, proceeded to go and arrest Billy and uh, Ike Clanton for carrying firearms. And it so happened that... Uh, uh, Virgil Earp snuck up on uh, Ike Clanton, who'd gone gunning for uh, Wyatt Earp or, or even Virgil Earp, since he didn't like him. And he heard that uh, they was in town, and so he was after them. So uh, he'd come up behind them and pulled out his uh, pistol, hit him on the side of the head, called pistol whipping, cut open his head, stunned him, and at the same time fell to the ground, and he pulled out his gun, took him to the jail and locked him up, had a trial, found him guilty and fined him and warned him not to show around town with his six shooters on or he'd be in worse trouble. Well, that uh, didn't set too right with Ike Clanton. He was the older of the Clanton boys and uh, he'd been uh, fuming and stewing for a fight for quite some time. And it just so happened that uh, Wyatt Earp, his brother got involved in it, Morgan Earp, and uh, Virgil had deputized Wyatt and Morgan and they had a good friend named Doc Holliday. Now, Doc Holliday wasn't a real doctor, and some say he was a dentist, but uh, uh, none the same. Uh, Doc Holliday was basically a gambler, uh, a drinker, a strong drinker, uh, dying of tuberculosis. Uh, he was in his uh, very early 30s and uh, skinny as a rail. But uh, he came along to help uh, Wyatt Earp under these difficult situations with uh, the McLowrys and the Clantons ganging up against the Earp brothers. And um, back, uh, it finally happened. It was about uh, 3 in the afternoon on October 26th that um, Wyatt Earp, Virgil, and Doc Holliday started going down Fremont Street and Tombstone. Now, I've been there. There's not much to look at. The town's basically much the same as it was back during the days of Wyatt Earp. Turned into a ghost town uh, just uh, before the turn of the century. And as they were walking down Fremont Street, a sheriff by the name of Behan came out and saw uh, Virgil and he, uh, with Wyatt and the fellas there, and he says, look, 
uh, go back. They're not going to cause any trouble. I've disarmed them. In other words, I've taken the guns off of them. And uh, they're not in the city limits with their guns. And uh, so uh, Virgil basically ignored Sheriff Behan. See, Virgil feared that Sheriff Behan was buddies uh, with this uh, faction, this cowboy uh, cattle rustling faction, possibly making money on the sides through cattle rustling. So he didn't have much respect for Behan, and he proceeded to go down the street. So as they walked down this showdown, uh, they, they faced each other off, and they, they came at this Montgomery's OK Corral stable. Uh, Tom uh, or Frank McLary, one of the two McLary brothers, had their horse uh, there. And uh, as they came forward, Billy Clanton, the, the youngest Clanton brother, uh, he said, uh, I don't want to fight. I, I, I don't want to shoot. And um, Virgil says, you men are under arrest. Uh, uh, throw up your arms and give up your guns. And so they, they, they went for their guns. And, of course, this is happening very quickly, and I'm going to give you the narration uh, in, a, in a kind of a long process, but this all happened within 30 seconds. Uh, and so Virgil said, I didn't mean that. Now, apparently what happened is when he said, give up your arms, he meant to basically hand the arms or hand the guns over. But um, Billy Clanton and uh, Tom McLowry, they both reached for their guns, and they didn't uh, hand them over. They reached to shoot. And at that very moment, as they reached to shoot, uh, Wyatt Earp, fast on the draw, seeing the situation. Oh, by the way, Wyatt says, you've been itching for a fight, and now you've got it. Those are Wyatt Earp's uh, words. This all happened again very quickly. And so uh, they reached for the gun. Wyatt pulled back the hammer uh, and shot. There was two shots simultaneously. Uh, Billy Clanton missed. Uh, Tom McLary missed. And uh, Wyatt Earp, he hit. Uh, 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 Billy Clanton and, and uh, Billy Clanton fell back to the ground. Uh, Tom McLaurie was then shot. Uh, Doc Holliday uh, took, he had a sawed off shotgun with him. He pulled out his shotgun and he blasted uh, Frank McLaurie, lifted him off the ground, a hideous swoon between the third and the fifth rib, uh, knocked him to the ground. He staggered back about a half a block and, and fell dead. Uh, Tom McLaurie was trying to reach for the, ri for the rifle in the scabbard of his brother's horse and trying to pull this rifle out. Yes, indeed, he didn't have a gun, uh, as, he, as they were saying. Some of them did and some didn't. So he's trying to reach for this, this uh, lever-action carbine, and he's pulling it out. And at the same time, uh, Billy Clanton, uh, who'd been shot in the wrist and in the side, he'd, fell, he'd fallen back an old, an, against an old building, and he, and he got himself in, in a position similar to, to a, a kneeling position. And uh, being wounded, he, uh, he switched his gun hand. His right wrist was wounded. He switched his gun hand to his left hand, and he lifted his arm up so he could take some better aim. Now, he must have been a bad shot. By the way, this is what's so amazing about the story. They were all within 10 feet of each other. Uh, when all this lead is flying, except for the fact that Billy was shot back, and he did go back about 15 to 20 feet. Uh, Frank, being shot in the rib, has gone back a half a block, but most of them are still very close. This horse is carrying on, and the shooting's firing, uh, commencing, and the bullets are flying, lead's flying thick. And so Billy, he ends up uh, shooting uh, Morgan, Earp, the uh, Wyatt Earp's brother, in the shoulder blade. So he hit him along this side, and the bullet went completely through one shoulder blade and out the other shoulder blade as he was standing sideways. And so both uh, the bullets had gone through the shoulder blades and uh, didn't kill him, but wounded him, and he fell to the ground. And uh, uh, Wyatt Earp said, get behind me, Morg, you know, st stay behind me. So there he got behind him. And uh, the shooting is still uh, start, uh, commencing and, and carrying on. And then uh, uh, Tom uh, McLaurie, or either Tom or Frank, I, I think it's Tom, he, he said, I got you now. And he said that to Doc Holliday. And he was very close. But Doc Holliday, as skinny as he was, he turned sideways just as a shot from the McLaurie brother went out. And the bullet grazed his, his uh, side between his holster and his side. Didn't do any damage. And then uh, Doc Holliday uh, put the, the shotgun down, took out his pistol, and shot at the same time Wyatt shot and, and Virgil shot. And uh, all three bullets uh, uh, went into his body, but one fight fatally into his head, and he dropped over dead. 
Then that just left uh, Billy uh, Claiborne to, uh, to carry on. Now, you're saying, well, where is Ike Clanton, the, the ringleader of this whole problem? Well, Ike Clanton, during all the shooting, he came up to Wyatt Earp. It's crazy. He came up to Wyatt Earp in the midst of all these bullets, and he grabbed Wyatt's shooting hand. So he's got a shooting hand, and uh, he's, 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 we don't, we're not sure what's going on. He's either trying to take the gun out of his hand, not having a gun, Wyatt Earp, just didn't shoot him right there in cold blood. And uh, so Wyatt said, get your gun and go to shooting to get out. And so Ike Clanton, seeing that he couldn't stop these men, couldn't get his gun, uh, he just goes running off into a place called Fly's F-L-Y-S Studio. It was a photography studio. And Doc Holliday took a pot shot at him with his buckshot shotgun and missed him. So he got away safe and sound. But uh, Billy Clanton, the younger brother, is there uh, the whole time. You know the tragedy about Billy, he did say, I don't want to fight. And uh, he said he didn't, he, he, he didn't come to shoot, and yet he was the first to shoot. But you know, it teaches me a Bible principle that's found in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that I always like to tell youngsters listening. There might be some of you young ones listening. Of course, it can't apply to us older ones, but usually we're a little more careful. The Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. So be very careful who you hang around with. You might have good intentions, but uh, with bad company, you can get messed up. In this case, it costs this young man his life. Well, he's the last shooting, and uh, he goes on to take another quick shot when Doc Holliday spies him. He takes his pistol and shoots at the same time. I believe it was Virgil, because Virgil was shot in the leg by the same boy. Billy uh, Clanton shot Virgil, so Virgil is falling on his knee, and he's on one knee, uh, wounded. Morgan is on the ground, Wyatt's standing, Doc Holliday is standing, and uh, Virgil shoots, and uh, Doc Holliday at the same time, they both hit Billy Clanton uh, uh, in, in the chest, and he drops over, uh, struggling for his last breaths, and dies. Well, all that narration that I just told you in about 10 minutes or so, all that narration took place in 30 seconds. There was over 26 shots fired in 30 seconds, bullets flying everywhere. Uh, uh, at that moment, three lay dead, Tom and Frank and Billy. Ike Clanton got away. Another gang uh, member of the, of the cowboy uh, faction, uh, uh, Claiborne, a fellow by the name of Claiborne, he, he wasn't involved in the battle. He was ne watching nearby. I guess he thought he'd help him, but when, the, when he saw the, the, the possibility of his death, he, he backed down. And uh, uh, Virgil wounded, Morgan wounded, Doc Holliday, if you want to call that a wound on his side, was a wound. And uh, the only one not hit at all by any lead ball was Wyatt Earp. And so that uh, ended up becoming one of the most famous battles in the Old West. Now, what happened to them was this. They went to court. And, uh, of course, uh, some of the factions that liked Billy and Ike Clanton and all those fellows, uh, they, they called it murder. And uh, yet the judge uh, released him, saying that he, they were under uh, the, the authority of Virgil Earp. They were deputized, and everything was above board. These men were carrying guns illegally in the city limits. And, yes, these sheriffs had the right to, to do the arrest. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie in a scripture that I really like in the Bible. And a lot of times youngsters, young people especially, read the Bible and they think it's boring. Well, with the right imagination, you can make the Bible most exciting, uh, most alive, and most wonderful. The uh, scripture I'm going to use for you is found in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. It's the story. I call it the Bible showdown. Did you know there was a showdown in the Bible? If you make the Bible exciting and, 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 and depict it with historical story, you can, you can make a enjoy, enjoyable Bible reading. Well, in, in the Holy Scriptures, uh, the, the story involves a, a, a prophet, everybody knows, by the name of Elijah, and a very wicked king by the name of Ahab. And as the story unfolds, and I know it so well, I'll just narrate it to you from the Scripture. As the story unfolds, uh, there's a famine in the land. There hasn't been water for quite some time. And, and uh, uh, Obadiah, Obadiah was a godly man. He, he worked with, um, with King Ahab, who was one of the most wicked kings in Israel. You might say he was Ahab's right arm man, and uh, he was sort of the governor of the palace. Uh, Ahab and Obadiah are out looking for water this, this nice, fine, hot, dry, and dusty day. Been dusty and dry for several years now, approximately three years. And uh, livestock was, uh, was just about gone. And uh, Ahab said, look, uh, we're, we're not only going to all die of, uh, of famine because of no water, but our livestock's going to die, and we're just in bad shape. 
And unless we can keep them alive, we're not going to get the, the products that we need from our livestock, and we're going to be in big trouble. I say we do this. Ahab told Obadiah to take the high road, and Obadiah said, I'll take the low road, and we'll both kind of meet up somewhere down the along the line somewhere, and you see if you find water, and you tell me, and if I find water, I'll send a runner to tell you, and we'll all be happy. So they're out looking for water, and as they're out looking for water, uh, uh, Obadiah's going down this old dusty road, and, and, and he sees, and right there down the road, he can't, he rubs his eyes, he can't believe what he's about to what he's seeing there, what he's, he's, he's before him is, is none other than Elijah. And so he, he walks up to Elijah, and most respectfully, he bows before Elijah. He says, oh, Elijah, you know, great prophet of God, oh, uh, where, I've, where have you been? And Elijah says, well, I've been around. Don't you worry. Well, we've been looking high and low for you. Did you know there's wanted posters, wanted, dead or alive, all over Israel looking for you? Ahab is out to cook your goose because you caused this famine. And, uh, and he, he, he's out looking for you. And, and where have you been? He says, well, I've been around, I told you. But uh, uh, do you tell Ahab that I want to have a showdown with that old varmint? Of course, I'm making this in modern vernacular, kind of cowboy uh, uh, lingo. Uh, make the story a little more exciting. And uh, he said, well, look, I, I, you can't go send me and leave you because if I go find him and I come back and tell him I saw you, and you're the kind of prophet that's here one moment and gone the next. You might just disappear. The Spirit of the Lord will carry you off somewhere. And you know what he'll do? He'll wring my neck. Now, please don't send me to do that. Don't you know what I've done? And he goes on to tell some great deed he did. You see, Ahab's... Uh, a wife, Jezebel, is a wicked woman, and she killed many of the prophets of God. So Obadiah, seeing that the prophets' lives were at stake, he hides them in caves. Uh, he puts 50 in one and 50 in another, and at the risk of his life, with a scarcity of water and food, he's feeding these prophets with the king's food and provisions. And he says, if the, if, if, he says I've helped these prophets. Please don't send me. I mean, the, the least you can do is come with me. He says, no, I ain't coming. You tell him I'll meet him and I'll wait for him. He says, are you sure you're going to tell me the truth across your heart, hope to die, stick a needle in your eye? He says, I tell you, you go and get that old varmint. I'm waiting for him. And so Obadiah says, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Really? Yes, I'm really, really, really. And so they begins to back up. And I could just picture Obadiah backing down the road. And then when he can't see him any further, he turns around and whoo, lickety split, he begins to run as fast as his feet can carry him. Ahab, Ahab, he goes on to yell. And Ahab, he sees Ahab in the distance. Ahab's greatly excited. Ahab thinks maybe they found water. And so they begin to run. He begins to run towards Obadiah. And Obadiah's running towards him. He says, Ahab, Ahab. Ahab says, did you find the water? Is that why you're so excited? No. I found greater than water. I found the source of water. What are you talking about? I found the man that caused the problem. Who? I found Elijah. You what? I found Elijah. You, you. I can just imagine this king grabbing him by the throat and holding him up against the tree. You, you found Elijah. You, you didn't hold him. Why didn't you hold him? I've been looking for him for three years. You, I'm going to kill you. But, but he's, he's grasping for breath. He says, leave me alone. Wait, let me talk. Let me talk. He wants to meet with you. What? You telling the truth? He wants to have a showdown with you. Where is he? Come with me, I'll show you. And sure enough, they began to walk down this dusty trail. And just like two old gunfighters facing themselves off, it was Elijah and Ahab walking down this old dusty road, facing each other off, checking each other out, squaring each other up. And then they stop within probably, oh, 10, 15, 20 feet away. And Ahab speaks first. He says, so there you are the worst troublemaker in Israel. And uh, Elijah responds, I'm not the troublemaker of Israel. You are. Not only you, you and your father, your whole lineage stinks. And your wife is a, is a reprobate queen. She's killed, she's killed many a great man of God. You're, we're going to have a showdown tomorrow at Mount Carmel. You call the whole house of Israel, and I want you to bring your prophets of Baal, 450 of them. And then I want you to bring those old 400 uh, false prophets that your wife's supporting at the dinner table, and you bring all 850 and call the whole house of Israel. We're going to find out whose God is really God. I'll be there. You just show up, you coward. I'm going to be there. I told you. Now you show up. And so both these men go their separate way. Well, the whole house of Israel didn't take them to ask them twice to come. 
a showdown of a lifetime, you think they're going to miss this? Not on your, not on a, a, a false bet. Man, these, these people started coming all over the place. They brought their blankets, probably picnic lunches. They set blankets all over the hillside. And then Elijah stepped forward and he says the most amazing thing. I want to read this to you from Scripture so you know that I'm not making any of this up. Tremendous quote. So Ahab gathered together and all the children of Israel. They gathered with their false prophets on Mount Carmel. Verse 21 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, then follow Baal. The people answered him not a word. It was a challenge laid before them. In other words, Elijah was saying, look, if God is God, you better, you better go for God. But if, 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 if um, uh, Baal is God, serve God. You can't be between two opinions. And then he told, uh, he, he told uh, um, uh, Ahab, you go first with your false prophets. And he took out an old cow, and they stuck that old cow on the altar, and they began to march around that cow. And uh, they, hey, Baal, 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 they began to say, Baal, Baal, Baal. And you know what's amazing? Nothing happened. He, you know, Elijah said, don't light the fire. Let a bolt of lightning come from uh, uh, sky. If your God is a God, he can consume that thing without any fire. Boy, they took the challenge. They began to march, oh, Baal, Baal, oh, Baal. And so finally, after a little while, Elijah says, hey, cut. Would you guys uh, uh, cry louder? Maybe your God's on vacation. He's, having, he's taunting them. Uh, in one of the versions I read, it says he's pursuing. That means he's out hunting. Another version I read said um, he's, he's constipated. You know, maybe, maybe he's, he's busy in the restroom and he can't come out. And he, just Elijah's having the greatest old time with these guys. Cry louder. Thank you, old, old Mr. Elijah. We'll try again. Bow! 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 They began to jump, shout. Uh, they took out their lances. They began to cut themselves. Very common to many pagan religions of the East. Cut themselves, lacerated. The craziest thing, they jumped up on the very altar where the bolt of lightning is supposed to come down, and they're cutting themselves up. Blood's everywhere. And Elijah says, cut! Well, not really cut, but, he, you know, that, no, stop. He says, uh, that's very impressive. Now, your God hasn't done too much for you. Why don't you sit down and rest? This went on for quite some time. He simply told the people of Israel, and I love this passage here in 1 Kings. He said this to them. He said, you have sacrificed to the wrong God. Why have you done this? And then he goes on to say, the Lord is God. And he, began, uh, he went over to the fallen altar, and, and he began to reconstruct the old altar that they used to sacrifice to the true God. By the way, listen to me. When you serve a false religion, it's going to cost you money. When you serve anything besides God, it might look like fun, but it's just draining your pocketbook. They built this beautiful altar, but that altar did nothing. Their finances were wasted. And Elijah picked up a stone. He said, Oh, house of Israel, this stone stands for Judah. And boy, all the tribe of Judah said, Judah, Judah. This one, Ephraim, Ephraim, Ephraim. He began to reconstruct, trying to recall their past days when they really served the Lord, to grip, grip their conscience. And then the altar was then assembled. Get some water. And they had these large uh, uh, earthen vessels. They held about uh, uh, six quarts each. And um, he said, pour it over the altar. That cow was laid up there, dead. They began to pour that water. He dug a trench around there. He, he, he poured uh, 12 gallons of water. Of course, I can imagine the prophets of Baal going, <laughs> even if the fire came down, there's no way I'll burn that up. This guy's crazy. Man, we're going to win this bet. This guy's nuts. Oh, the house of Israel going, wow, what's gotten into him? And so they began to, uh, he, he simply went up and he said his prayer. Oh, God, you are the Lord. Allow the nation of Israel to see your hand. And that's all it took. Out of the sky came a bolt of lightning. It began to burn. Man, it started to cook that, cat, that old heifer. That heifer was rare, and then it was medium, and then it was well done. And brother, it was just burnt. Bolt of lightning hitting that old heifer. That old cow started to, to be consumed. The hide, the bones, everything. Bones are snapping popping with a the heat. Then the rocks 
God is burning on the rocks. The fire is going steaming up to the sky. The burning, the, the steaming, the rocks are snapping. The ground's hot. Ow, ow. Elijah might have been jumping around as that fire was hitting there, burning the ground, popping the rocks, the steam going up to the sky, the bolt of lightning coming down. And the prophets of Baal going, and the house of Israel going, and all of a sudden, the fire goes, it's gone as fast as it came. And all that's left is the steam. The house of Israel hit the deck. Oh, God, you are the only God. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Elijah. We worship you only. And Elijah's worshiping, but he looks over his shoulder, and the prophets of Baal are going, uh-oh, let's get out of here. We're not welcome around here any longer. And they started to sneak out. But Elijah says, seize them, prophets. And they grabbed the prophets, stopped them, take them down to the Kishron brook. And Elijah says, line them up. And they had prophets lined up all the way down the row. And Elijah, the scripture tells them, I'm not making this up. It says he drew a sword. But, I, you know, I want to use this the old west way. Elijah lined them up. He pulled out a six-shooter. <laughs> shot down all those prophets. Well, he would have had he had a gun in those days. He used a sword. Now, you know why I like that? It sounds ruthless, doesn't it? Well, it is ruthless. The Bible says our God is indeed a consuming fire in Hebrews. Ezekiel chapter 14 says the people of Israel had given their hearts to idols. My warning right now as I close is this. God has a plan for our lives, but you know what will destroy that plan? Idolatry. We better be careful that we don't toy with saying we're Christians and then live as if we're not Christians. So caught up with the things of this world that our heart is turned from God. The day will come that we will stand before God who's a lot mightier, a lot more powerful, a lot more awesome than Elijah. If Elijah drew his gun and shot down 400 prophets or used his sword and stabbed every one of them, killed them, what do you think our God is? Our God is a God of love, indeed. Thank God for Jesus Christ. He died and res resurrected on the third day. But you know what? We need to work out our salvation, the Bible says, with fear and trembling. For it's God that works in us. It's time in America and in uh, the parts of the world for Christians to know the Lord, to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, to have a heart that's tender and right for the Lord, a heart that's seeking the Lord, a heart that kneels before the Lord and says, Oh, Lord God, you are the only one. Let's pray that prayer. Father in heaven, I ask you, as we have a showdown with you right now through prayer, that you will, will uh, confirm in our heart that we love you. Guard our hearts not to be snared with the things of this world. All of us, Lord, uh, help us to walk carefully, circumspectly before you. And Lord, I thank you for those listening. Would you bless them and help them to know you, to serve you, to love you, and to keep in that narrow road that leads to heaven. Uh, for many are go the broad road that leads to destruction. And Father, we want to be on that narrow road. Help us, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.